So the Kona Hanzo ST hardtail that I've been riding for the past year, year and a half, it's an awesome bike. I really enjoy riding it, but it does ride a little bit on the harsh side. It's a very beefed up frame and the manufacturers probably don't want to see this thing break. So it's got a bunch of like extra gussets and support pieces that all together kind of make this a slightly overbuilt frame. And so what I've got here is actually a new house metalworks hummingbird in size medium plus, very similar size to the Kona Hanzo. And so in this video, what I would like to do is to attempt to quantify compliance in a frame. I know, it's a big ask. And so what I've done is I've taken some accelerometer data on the Kona Hanzo, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. And my plan is to swap everything on the Kona Hanzo as it is right now, and just swap it over to this frame in its exact same state. And then I'll go out and take the exact same data, and then we'll see if we can identify any differences that suggest one frame is more compliant than the other. So all you armchair engineers out there, get ready, it's gonna be a sciencey one. But first we have to swap everything over from the Hanzo onto the new house. Okay, so it's a different day now. The new house went together super quick. Again, everything was just a direct swap, all the same parts, everything. And I've actually already gone out and collected the data on this new build. So to dive right into the nerdy stuff, I'm using this device right here to capture vibrations while riding. Now this is called a Yoast Labs 3Space Mini Data Logger, but don't be fooled by its size. This thing is a legitimate scientific instrument with a high precision attitude and heading reference system and an inertial measurement unit. It's got onboard micro SD card storage for logging data without needing to be tethered to a computer. At its core, it's a nine degree of freedom sensor with three degrees of freedom each on the gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer. It's also got onboard Kalman filtering and quaternion-based orientation filtering, and it all comes in a package the size of a quarter and weighs in at nine grams. So really good at capturing vibration data in tight spaces. Now, let me just start by saying that the new house Hummingbird is without a doubt more compliant and comfortable to ride than the Kona Hanzo. Qualitatively speaking, it's really no comparison, but I wanted to make sure it wasn't just in my head. After all, new house Metalworks is a boutique frame builder whose hand-built frames sell for more than three times that of the mass-produced Hanzo. And the fact that YouTubers like Steve from Hardtail Party called this the most compliant and smooth riding hardtail they've ever ridden could potentially have been influencing how the ride felt to me. So my idea here is to compare accelerometer data on the Kona Hanzo and the new house Hummingbird to try and tease out any differences in compliance using a more quantitative approach. Now in theory, lower amplitude acceleration values would correspond to a more comfortable ride. Now the data that I took was the following. So on each bike, I chose two different locations to mount the data logger. One was at the rear dropout and the other was at the base of the seat tube as close to the bottom bracket as possible. So that makes four data sets, two per bike. But in the interest of considering repeatability, I actually doubled up on runs taking two independent measurements for each of the four different configurations for a total of eight data sets. The bike was also configured exactly the same on both frames in an effort to isolate the effect of the frame. 20 PSI in each tire, the dropper post was dropped, and the fork settings were exactly the same for all experimental runs. And then the section of trail that I chose was on a local loop here in Fullerton, and it's a short quarter mile section at an average downhill grade of 7%, according to Strava. Now this might seem short, but I'll explain why the length of the section isn't as important as the variation of terrain in just a minute. Now the top of the run is the steepest and fastest with some ruts and imperfect fire roads. It's not perfectly smooth, but it's also also not like a rock garden. Then towards the bottom, it smooths out a bit with your typical trail vibrations just propagating through the frame. Now the reason I chose this section is because there is some variation in the terrain from smooth to moderately bumpy, but at the same time, there was nothing rowdy enough to saturate the sensors. Now I had the data logger configured to measure within a range of plus or minus eight Gs, which sounds like a lot, but you'd be surprised at how quickly the accelerations can exceed eight Gs on a typical rowdy descent. Okay, so before I put up the actual data, I do need to explain the concept of something called the frequency domain because it's kind of what makes this experiment work. 
And so try and stick with me. It's a complex topic, but I'll do my best to distill it down to what we need to get through the rest of the video. So if you look at a single sine wave, it looks like what you remember from high school math class. It's just a perfect sinusoidal up and down. And this is what the signal looks like in the time domain. Notice the x-axis is time. However, in what's called the frequency domain, a single sine wave like this looks a little bit different. Now this is called a power spectral density plot, or PSD, and it's a plot not in the time domain, but rather in the frequency domain. Note the x-axis is frequency of oscillation and not time. Now in this plot, the same sine wave that we just saw is a single spike at the frequency of oscillation. The plot is really just an indication of the amount of power in a given signal as a function of frequency. So in this basic example, all the power is at this one frequency since it's a perfect sine wave and there's no power anywhere else. So for instance, let's go back to the time domain and now look at a signal that contains two pure sine waves at different frequency. It looks a little bit weirder, but this is what it looks like in the time domain. In the frequency domain, however, as you might have guessed, the same signal is represented as two distinct spikes at their respective frequencies. Now this type of plot, the PSD, is much more useful when you're analyzing vibrational data because a typical vibration signal like the ones collected on the trail are not one or two perfect sine waves but rather they look more like a crazy cluster of seemingly random vibrations. Now it was Fourier who came along in the early 1800s and showed us that any stationary periodic signal can be broken down into some linear combination of many perfect sine waves through something called the Fourier transform. And that's really the key here. Crazy looking vibrational signal that looks like this in the time domain might actually look like this in the frequency domain. Now in this hypothetical example here, we have two vibrational signals that look virtually the same in the time domain, but once you look at them in the frequency domain, we can reveal that one signal has a lot of power in the lower frequency range, and the other has more power in the higher frequency bandwidth. And so with that extremely brief introduction into the frequency domain, we can now look at some of the data from our experiment. All this code is basically doing is bringing in the raw data that was stored in text files on the SD card on the logger and converting it into vector format in MATLAB. I'm also chopping the ends of the data off where nothing was happening at the beginning and end of each run with this bit of code here. And so the resulting time domain data for all eight runs looks like this. It's basically a giant mess and you wouldn't be able to discern much about compliance just by looking at this time domain data. Now recall that for each of the eight runs, the sensor was recording accelerations in three independent directions or degrees of freedom. The up and down acceleration, as in from the bottom of the bike towards the top is what we'll call the vertical direction. The front to back acceleration we'll call fore aft direction and the side to side accelerations We'll call the lateral direction. And I can plot all three degrees of freedom by choosing which column of the data matrix to plot. So in this case, we know that this is the vertical direction only because if you look at the data, you can see that it's centered about 1g, which is the vertical acceleration due to gravity that we all live in on planet Earth. The lateral accelerations, on the other hand, are centered about 0g's as expected. But nonetheless, like I said, in the time domain, it's basically just a mess and we really can't conclude anything about compliance in this domain. So what we're going to do is to take a look at the same data in the frequency domain. So I'm going to isolate the data here and show you the power spectral densities in the vertical direction with the logger mounted at the rear axle. Now take a look at the legend here. This is two runs on the Hanzo in blue and red and the two runs on the new house are in yellow and purple. And this data set was meant to be a control for the experiment. So basically by mounting the accelerometer as close to the rear axle as possible, we've isolated the effect of the frame because the vibrational path is only going from the ground through the tires, the rim, the spokes, the hub, and then into the data logger. We're basically just measuring vibrations from the ground through the wheel in these data sets. And since we use the exact same wheel tire setup on the exact same section of trail, all four of these data sets should look the same, and for the most part, they do. In all cases, the primary bandwidth of trail vibrations fall within this sort of 10 to 30 hertz range, where we see most of the power in the signal, and in all four experiments, these peaks are very similar. Now, if I had chosen a different trail or set the tire pressure differently or used a different wheel, these plots would all look very different. So this is mainly an indication that the subsequent data should be an apples to apples comparison. Now, something that was really surprising to me at first was the bottom bracket data. So moving over here, this is the vertical acceleration when measured at the bottom bracket for all four runs. And I mean, just look at it. They're basically all the same. Now, when compared to the rear axle, we can see that the accelerations measured at the bottom bracket are a few decibels lower, 
which is an indication that there's some amount of vibration damping through the rear triangle of the frame. But this data also suggests that there's virtually no difference in vertical compliance between the two frames. Now this was a huge surprise to me because the rear end of the new house is so clearly more comfortable than the Kona. But the data shows that the vertical accelerations are the same. And so I thought about it for a little bit and it does kind of make sense. I mean, the reason the double triangle design works so well for bikes is that the triangle is the strongest and most stable geometric shape. And so I do find it hard to believe that the chain stays and the seat stays are actually extending and contracting in length as you plow through chunky trails. That's just not where compliance in a hardtail frame comes from. So what's really going on here? Why is it that the new house feels so much more compliant than the Kona? Well, some have hypothesized that compliance in the rear end of a non-suspended frame is actually more closely linked to the lateral flexure than vertical. In other words, the idea is that the comfort you feel when riding through the chunk is not because the rear end of the frame is actually bending up and down, but rather because it's allowed to flex side to side. Which, I know, it sounds like a bold claim, but fortunately we actually have the data that we need to explore this idea. So remember that the data logger measures accelerations in all three degrees of freedom for every run, so for the same vertical data sets we just looked at, we can just pull the corresponding lateral accelerations out of the same data matrix. Which is what we're seeing here. So again, we're seeing that primary bandwidth of vibrations in the 10 to 30 hertz range, but this time we can see a difference in this lateral acceleration data that we didn't see in the vertical case. Now I know it's hard to see at first, but I've been staring at PSDs for a long time for other work-related research, and this is actually not insignificant what we're seeing here. Now if you look at everything below about 15 hertz, it's pretty similar for both bikes. But when you look at this more narrow bandwidth between about 20 to 30 hertz, which is about half of the primary vibrational bandwidth, you can see a significant reduction in signal power on the new house frame. So in this region, the Kona data, the red and the blue, is consistently around two to five decibels higher than the new house. And at some points, it's actually closer to like a seven decibel reduction in the vibrational intensity on the new house. And recall that the decibel scale is actually a logarithmic scale, which means that the intensity of the signal doubles for every three decibels is increased. So the two to seven decibel reduction in the 20 to 30 hertz range on the new house is actually quite compelling despite how minimal it may look. Now, the keen observer may look at the whole plot and notice that over here in the 80 to 120 hertz bandwidth, there's actually an increase in power on the new house compared to the Kona. Now, that would definitely require some more sophisticated studies to sort out, but fundamentally, a metal frame is just a damped mass spring damper system. And by tuning the tubes and the wall thicknesses and changing up the welds, one can pretty effectively change the frequency domain properties. Now, in the frequency domain, it's always a bit like whack-a-mole to some degree. Uh, typically, if you attempt to squash one bandwidth down, often another will crop up somewhere else. But in this case, because the absolute power level of this higher frequency bandwidth is so low compared to the primary vibrational bandwidth, I mean, we're talking 15 to 20 decibels less, it's a little bit like quieting someone down who's screaming at a party to half power in exchange for increasing the volume of a few people whispering in the corner to a slightly louder whisper, if, if that makes any sense. So let's do a little bit of a recap here. The new house Hummingbird is definitely more compliant compared to the Kona Hanzo, but it does seem that vertical compliance, as we typically think about it, is virtually non-existent, which is weird. In other words, both of these frames had basically the same vertical rigidity in the rear triangle, which does make sense. They both have the same general triangular shape. And metal tubes in this triangular configuration aren't really going to stretch or compress in the axial direction to provide compliance. Rather, the data here seems to suggest that the compliance we actually feel while riding might have more to do with the lateral flex in the primary bandwidth of your typical trail vibrations. Now, one thing I did notice right Way, is that if I lean the bike over a bit and press down on the bottom bracket with my foot in the axial direction of the, the, the bottom bracket spindle, the new house flexes way more than the Hanzo, which does kind of agree with our experimental findings. Now, to appease all you armchair engineers out there, let me assure you that I don't believe that this is conclusive evidence that lateral compliance is what we're actually feeling and that vertical compliance in a frame isn't really a thing. I do understand that more data collected by independent researchers 
might yield different results. I also wanna acknowledge that these data sets were taken three weeks apart. I get busy with family and work stuff, and I just wasn't able to do it all in the span of a couple of days. But again, that's a big reason for taking the rear axle data, as it served as a control for the experiment, and we did see that the rear axle data was virtually the same for all the data sets. Now, anything else that I missed or you're curious about, uh, let's just start by asking insightful questions in the comments, rather than trying your hardest to poke holes in the process without providing any constructive feedback. <laughs> I am legitimately interested to hear your thoughts on this since compliance is such a buzzword in the industry. My only request is that we keep it civil. Now I do have a couple more videos about the new house Hummingbird lined up, including a dedicated review video, as well as some upgrades that I'm planning to try out. So if you're interested, definitely stay tuned for those. So I know this was a longer one than usual. If you managed to stick around this long, I really appreciate it. Again, let us know your thoughts down below. Thanks again for watching and thanks for subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. We'll see you next time.